Jesus loves, but now I'm found. Was August 3rd, 
give up life joy. They lined up to sail across the big sea, willing to die to keep the whole land free. There's an old man standing in the crowd. Though he stands in silence, his soul cries loud. As tears roll down his cheeks and off his chin, he remembers his fellow soldiers dying around him. Don't forget to thank the brave women and men who were lucky enough to come home again. And remember the terror their dreams still yield and the ones who gave their souls on the battlefield. Honor the ones who were killed here at home as the terror of war <coughs> takes on a new form. And be thankful for the freedom we all cherish because defending it at home, brave men have perished. Lest we forget, lest we forget, lest we forget, lest we Karki? If not, do you think he should be? If he does not think that you and your country are worth fighting for, do you think he's worthy of you? Don't pity the girl who's alone. Oh no, her young man is probably a soldier fighting for her and her country and for you. If your young man neglects duty to king and country, the day may come when he'll neglect you. Think it over. Then ask him to join the army. Today! Is your best boy wearing khaki? Is your best boy wearing khaki? What did you do in the war, Daddy? I read a recruiting advertisement in the paper the other day, and I wonder if the boys are responding properly. They would if they'd seen what the Germans have done in Belgium. It's not bad out there. A little bit cold, and, and the waiting gets on their nerves, but they're happy. Fit as a fiddle. I wonder how many you've joined. I'll always remember the day war was declared. We were all down at the armory, about a hundred of us. My husband was in the 48th band, and as soon as it was announced that Canada was at war, well, they went off into the crowd playing. Oh, rule Britannia! Away we went down the street of following. All of a sudden, a French flag appeared, and then some Union Jacks. And soon you couldn't move because of all the traffic. They were pulling the poles off of the streetcars. They were mobbing us. You'd think we 
was coming back from a war, not going to one. Montreal, Quebec, August 15th, 1914. I call for volunteers. Volunteers, mark you. I have insisted that this be a purely volunteer contingent. Not a man will be accepted but of his own free will, and not a married man shall go without the consent of his wife and family. I have no fears as to the outcome of this war. If the millions in Germany cannot be driven back by this first contingent, I feel sure I speak for all Canadians when I say that if necessary, 10, 20, 30 more contingents will follow. We are determined that the tyrants there shall never grind down the people of Canada. On the railway carriage wall stuck the poster. And I thought of the hand that penned its call. Fat civilians, wishing they could go and fight the Hun. Ah, but can't you see them thanking God that they are over 41? Let the girls with the feathers sing vulgar songs. Washy verse of England's need. Ah, but don't we darn well know how this message ought to read? Lads, you want it. Over there. Come and shiver in the morning dew. More poor devils like yourselves, waiting to be killed by you. Leave the harlots still the same. Comic songs about the Hun. Leave the fat old men to say. Ah, now we've got them on the run. Better twenty honest years than their dull three score and ten. Lads, you want it. Come and learn to live and die like honest men. Take your risk of life and limb underneath the clear blue sky. Live fast. Go up quick. Lads, you want it. Come and die. Grub on the Saxonia was hell. After having supper, I went up and gave the sharks a feed, my first seasickness. I'd started feeling for about 3 p.m., but managed to fight it off until then. I tried to make it to the deck, but I couldn't, so I used a porthole. <laughs> the young boys were lying around on the deck like a bunch of dogs, some not caring if the ship went to the bottom or not. They were that sick. The Bassett and Neep were located in a brewery adjacent to River Lies. And when we got there, we removed our tunics and trousers and tied them with our identification tags so they could be put through a delosing machine. And when we came inside, we were split into little groups of a dozen or so. And each group was allotted a vat in which we remained immersed up to our necks for five glorious minutes. At five minutes and 15 seconds, Cold hose was turned on to roast out the laggards. A clean shirt and pants and socks are handed out, and in these we return to the first building. And anyone who couldn't find his Delos trousers wandered around like lost sheep until he's given another pair, yards too big. And these he had to wear until he could arrange to rip them beyond repair on the next wiring party. Washing fails to kill lice, although as someone said it gives them an awful shock. Mm -hmm. The only way to get rid of these pests, and I have been rid of them for over a month now, is to sprinkle your underclothes with creolin, a disinfectant which our sanitary men use around latrines. It is an extract of tar. After application, when a man begins to sweat, he suffers the tortures of Hades. But it was worth the suffering. What luxury it was to lie down and sleep at night, instead of rolling and groaning, tearing madly at your flesh with your fingernails. They speak of trenches. No, no. Trenches is too romantic a name. These were just ditches. Ordinary, common ditches. And as time went by, these became filthy. We had no garbage disposal. No sewage disposal. You would simply dig a little trench off the main trench, then dig deep hole. 
And that disgusting thing would be a latrine. And everything that we didn't want, we just threw up and over for the rats and the flies. And if you could stand in a place where with powerful binoculars you could see these trenches, you see a strange line of disgusting garbage wandering uphill and down dale for as far as the eye could see. And in this gross filth, men lived. Sitting by the fireside as the evening shadows fall, gazing idly at the pipe rack hanging sideways on the wall. Underneath it in a corner, I can see an empty chair and a pair of well-worn slippers that are waiting for you there. They remind me that across the seas you've gone and I am left alone to carry on. Somewhere in France, somewhere in France, yonder across the sea, while I am here fondly dreaming of you, there you are dreaming of me. And you will know, where'er you go, my heart is faithful and true. Though you're far, far away, every hour of the day, I am somewhere in France with you.
No writer can describe a battle, and he who says that he does not feel nervous when ordered to charge, brags. After Tiamont and Louvain, we scattered and rode precipitately here and there, trying to reach Brussels. We chummed up, and as our horses were quite done in, we decided to dismount and rest. We hid behind a thick hedge. After some rest, and whilst discussing our next move, we noticed a faint light down the vale. We immediately made for this light. We arrived at a house, front door open, windows shattered, roof nearly off. There was no one to be seen. We went in the cellar, and there found what was hardly believable. Three creatures, one partially dressed, dead and leaning against the wall, a child clinging to her, another woman beside them, quite unconscious. We were debating what to do for the child when we were surprised by the entry of two Germans. Then began a strife impossible to describe. The intruders were overcome and killed. When we calmed down a bit, we were horrified to find the child's head beaten to a pulp and the second woman dead. We covered the poor creatures as best we could, and since we could do no more, we decided to rest. We found plenty of bread, dry fish, pickles, and a few bottles of beer. We lit another candle, and taking this bit of paper and my indispensable bottle of ink, I squatted down and took a record of the horrid scene. Don't be too severe on my artistic attempts, but I am out of it. It is as I saw it. God help me. Mother, December 25th, 8.30 a.m. Last night, Christmas Eve, I was looking out and saw four Germans leave their trenches. I told two of my men to go out and meet them, unarmed, as the Germans were unarmed. My men were to see that the Germans did not pass the halfway mark. We were about 300 yards apart at that time. Not knowing what was up, my, uh, my fellows were not very keen on going, so I decided to go alone. By the time I got to them, they were already three quarters of the way over, and their spokesman started off by saying that he thought it was only right to, to come over and, and wish us a happy Christmas. And he trusted us to uh, implicitly to keep the truth. 
Well, I assured him that we would. He told me that before the war he had been in Suffolk, where he left his best girl. He told me he had tried to get a letter to her, but could not. And he wanted to know if he could get one to her through me. Well, I made him write out a postcard right there and then, and sent it off that night. I asked him what, what orders they had from their officers as to, to coming over, and they said, none. They had come over out of goodwill. <laughs> well, when I returned to the trenches, I was surprised to hear a hell of a din going on and did not see a single man in the trenches. I saw, to my amazement, a crowd of about 150 men, British, French, Germans, all fraternizing in the most genuine possible manner. Every sort of souvenir was given and exchanged and, and addresses were, were given and received. and photos of family were shown. Well, a German NCO, mother, that's a non-commissioned officer, started his fellows off on some marching tunes. And when they had finished, I sent note to the boys of Body Scotland. And so we went on singing everything from Jolly Old King Wetzel's Lust. Right down to the ordinary Tommy song. We all ended up with old anxiety, which we all, English, Scotch, Canadians, Prussians, we all joined in. It was absolutely astounding. If I'd seen it on a cinemagraphic film, I would have said it was faked. No, nurse. I can't sleep. Sit with me a little, will you, nurse? The words were whispered very low. Down the long length of the ward, no one else was stirring, and the bed in which the speaker lay had screens all around it. He had not been in hospital very long, and he was more ill than he knew, being threatened with tetanus and quite blind. But it was only this morning that they had told him of his blindness. When will they take away the bandages so that I can see? Those were the words he spoke at the conclusion of each dressing. I do want to see. Why, I haven't even seen you, nurse. And he could <laughs> laugh as though the remark was a real humor. But today, they broke it to him. And in the little kitchen off the ward, I listened as his day nurse told me. How to be taken? I asked at length. She just shook her head. He just asked if they were certain there was nothing that could be done, she said. But he hasn't spoken since. So I waited beside him 
a little draft blowing upon us from an open window nearby. Nurse, you know I'm to be blind always. Yes, I said, and I took one of his hands in mine. But after a while, I drew a chair beside his bed, and we spoke in whispers about France, for it amused him to talk about some of the places in which he'd been billeted. And then he was hungry, so I fed him with hot buttered toast and hot milk, much sweetened. It'll be a month tomorrow since I was hit, he said as he crunched his last piece of toast. But all that time before seems like quite a different life. Then he added, Nurse, I say, you won't forget my early morning tea, will you? You did forget yesterday. And as he spoke those last words, he reached his hand out towards me, in his way of finding out whether or not I was offended. He died yesterday morning. The blind boy I'd become so fond of. It saddens me to think of these youngsters who left home with flags waving and bands playing. What a finish to a young life. I was among those who volunteered for a burial party. Whenever there is a lull in the firing, we do whatever we can to bury the bodies lying in the open. The captain gives us a stiff tot of rum and off we go. Here's one. We take off identification, identification disc and empty pockets. There we find almost everything from a stub of a pencil to the remains of their last 15 francs pay. But too often, we pull out a picture. There he stands, and she stands beside him. How smart he looks in his new uniform and how proud and happy she looks. Here's a family group. There he is. The others must be his father and mother and his kid sister. But the pictures always go back. They're too precious. This one is heavy set. I'm short, so I sit on the ground, put my feet against his body, bend my knees, brace my hands on the ground, and with my feet, shove him into a shell hole. Then I scrape the earth over him. No prayers, no flowers. I go to the next one. No head. No left arm. I look around. I don't see anything that resembles a head or an arm. 
Only God knows where they are. Battalion Middlesex Regiment General Service is ill at the 38th Field Ambulance of France, suffering from wounds and shock. January 1st, 1916. Dear, Dear Mother, mother. I, I'm very sorry that I did not write before now, but we were on the trenches, we were in the trenches on Christmas Day, and we had a lot to do. Also, I was sent to the hospital. Don't send any letters to the company. I won't get them. Dear mother, do not worry, for I'll be all right. January 6, 1916. Dear mother. I've been lying in the hospital nine days now. Lying in bed all the time, and I have a sore heel. I had it cut, and it's getting better. January 20th, 1916. Dear, Dear mother, mother. I am quite well. And, and I came out of the hospital on Wednesday the 19th. You do not know how I was longing for a letter from you. Mother, I'd like to know what the war office said about me. I was only shot in the back. February 23rd, 1916. Dear, Dear Mother. Oh, I'm sending you this letter to let you know that I have received your parcel. I'm hoping you're all quite well. But, Dear Mother, we were in the trenches and, and I was ill. So I, I went out. They took me to prison. And, and now I'm in a bit of trouble. I'm going to have to go in front of a court. I'll let you know in my next letter how I got on. Give my best love to Father and Katie, your loving son, Bertie. Madam, I am directed to inform you that a report has been received from the War Office to the effect that Bertram Phillips, 11th Battalion Middlesex Regiment, General Service, was sentenced after trial by court martial to suffer death by being shot for desertion, and that the sentence was duly carried out on the 20th of March, 1916. I am your obedient servant, P.G. Handley, 2nd Lieutenant, Infantry Records. <laughs> General de Morte had just been aroused from his sleep and was standing in the street as 12 soldiers and an NCO came round the corner. A firing party. My heart sank and a feeling of horror overcame me, for an execution was about to take place. General de Morte gave a look, then held up his hand, and the party halted. With his characteristic quick step, he went up to the doomed man he asked what he had been condemned for. It was for abandoning his post. The general then began to talk to the man. Quite simply, he explained discipline to him. Abandoning your post was letting down your pounds. More, it was letting down your country. He spoke of the necessity of example. 
how some could do their duty without prompting, but others, less strong, had to know and understand the supreme cost of failure. He told the condemned man that his crime was not venial, not low, and that he must die as an example so that others should not fail. Surprisingly, the wretch agreed. The burden of infamy was lifted from his shoulders. He saw a glimmer of something, maybe redemption, in his own eyes. Demorde went on, carrying the man with him to the comprehension that any sacrifice was worthwhile if it helped France. Yours is also a way of dying for your country, he said. The procession started again, but by now the victim was a willing one. The sound of the volley in the distance announced that it was all over. I knew two lads who had shot themselves. They just couldn't take it. They went half crazy. And of course, nothing was said about it. And their next to Kim were notified like everyone else's, killed in action. One lad in particular I knew quite well. He must have been about 30. He had been a clerk in a lawyer's office. A very quiet type and a well-educated lad and a darn good soldier. He'd been over there about a long time before he went haywire, and then he just got quieter and quieter. I found out afterwards that he had heard from someone back in Canada that his wife had been running around on him. He just went to a quiet place and said goodbye. George received orders that he should prepare to leave for the front lines in France, 
sometime after Reveille on the 9th. It was more luck than anything that I met him at the Cannon Street Station in London, as I had been given the wrong address in Shorncliffe. But luck was with us, and we subsequently met outside the station. We walked together down the street, and when we got to Trafalgar Square, George turned around and, to my surprise, asked me to marry him. How? I said. You're leaving for France on the 9th. Fortunately, a London policeman knows everything under the sun. So, I went up to a policeman who was on duty at the corner of Strand and Trafalgar Square and asked how one could get married in London. He laughed. It took a little more explaining to make him realize I really meant it. But when he did realize that I was serious, he indeed sent me to the right place and sent us to the registrar's office. He then gave us some well-intentioned advice. And that was to hurry, as it was about 12 o'clock, and the office would close at 1, and it was still some distance away. We arrived five minutes before closing, but because there was not enough time to perform the ceremony before closing, the registrar promised to perform the ceremony on the morning of Monday the 9th at 10 a.m., a mere two hours before George was to report to the 107th Battalion Canadian Pioneers. We spent the weekend buying a few things that George would need in France. On Sunday, we went down to Folkestone Harbor to inform George's commanding officer of our plans to marry and to ensure him that George would indeed meet the 12 o'clock departure deadline. On Monday, we arrived at the registrar's office with two witnesses and my birth certificate. When the registrar heard that I did not have the consent of my father, he studied my birth certificate with great care. I insisted that I had been of age for 20 days, so there could be no objection. The registrar consented with a paternal smile, and a couple of minutes later, with a gold ring borrowed from a friend, I became Mrs. George Blum. A few moments later, Big Ben chimed the hour, and after a passionate kiss, my husband left to join his regiment. Mrs. George H. Blom married October 9th, 1917. I never saw my husband George again. I talked to mail first to the fire command post located in the bank next to McCray's. And then I crossed over past the little cemetery to the Ray's farmhouse, where the mess was located. I saw him sitting on the ambulance step, a pad on his knee. He looked up when I approached, then continued to write. He was my senior officer, second in command of my brigade. I did not interrupt him. He wrote on for five minutes more. And then, when I handed him his mail, he handed me his pad. His face had looked very tired, yet calm as he wrote, and he would look around from time to time, his glance strained to Helmer's grave. No more killing, 
No more mutilated men. Four years of it seemed like four centuries. Take up our coral with